Open your Bibles right up to Acts chapter 17 this evening. I trust that this passage of Scripture this evening will be a real help for you in understanding um, sharing the Gospel and sharing the Gospel in different ages. We are in a portion of Acts where we are looking at Paul's missionary journeys. This is what would be traditionally known as the time when the Apostle Paul is taking the Gospel around the world and from town to town. And He has recently been to uh, Thessalonica and won a lot of, a lot of folks at Thessalonica, but the Jews there uh, started to protest the Apostle Paul and they raised up lewd fellows of the baser sort and they they uh, basically a bunch of mobsters, a bunch of low low lifes, and started riots. And because they started riots, it caused trouble for the you know constables and so forth, the rulers of the city. And it uh, made enough trouble that of course they blamed Paul and Jason for it. They they uh, decided to leave town. So Paul left town, and they went. Paul and Silas went to Berea. And they preached the gospel there. And the Bible says about the Bereans that they were more noble than the folks at Thessalonica because they searched the Scriptures to find out whether the things were so. And so they had great inroads with the gospel with the Bereans. And then the folks from Thessalonica, the Jews that caused trouble in Thessalonica, heard about the gospel being preached in Berea and went there to make trouble. And uh, kind of the same thing started to happen again. So Paul, Paul had to leave again. They... They sent him away to go by sea, but Silas and Timothy stood there or remained there still. So while Paul is waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him, he went to Athens. And <laughs> Athens was the center of education and philosophy at the time. And here we are in verse 16 of Acts chapter 17, and we'll begin reading our text tonight. And I really want to just read verse 16. And uh, then we're going to go down to uh, verse, verse 22 and read a couple verses of Paul's message. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now, I have to read verse 17. I don't want to leave it out of the text because of an important statement. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that, with, that met with him. Okay, now, in uh, verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now we'll pray, Father. I pray that you would help us this evening as we look at Paul's message. We are not to try to preach Paul, but to preach Jesus Christ. And as we look at his methods of sharing Jesus Christ, I pray that you would help us understand what the, what the method was and what the message was. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned in our prayer, I do want to look at the method and the message. This is a passage of Scripture that any Christian Bible college that teaches a course on apologetics is going to go to and use for an example of how to uh, give an apologia or a logical, from out of logic, defense, apology of your faith. Apology is not, uh, is not saying you're sorry for something. An apology is a logical defense of something. And so any good biblically based apologetics, which is going to help you understand how to share your faith and in a way that you are defending what you believe and also presenting what you believe from a defensible standpoint is going to reference Acts chapter 17. But I want to assure you this evening that the Apostle Paul is not de dependent upon logic and human wit in order to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I do want us to understand that Paul was neither intimidated by philosophers or individuals who were into knowing a new thing I want to focus for a minute on the crowd that Paul is going to. They're different than the folks at Berea. In Berea, there was a crowd of individuals that were known for studying to find out whether things were so or not. Listen, you want 
If you uh, want to preach the gospel, you can't find a better group than somebody who wants to ask good questions and find out whether you're making it up or whether it's really true. And by the way, Christian, <laughs> the only Christians I know that are bothered when they're questioned about their faith are Christians that don't know the answers to the questions that they're asked. And sometimes they feel as though their faith is being undermined because they cannot defend or they cannot uh, give a logical reason for what they believe. And you as a believer ought to be sure that you don't approach those grounds. Somebody asks you a question that's hard for you to answer, my friend. First of all, uh, understand that it's probably because you don't study as much as you ought to. And I know I'm not talking about reading everything that could be read. You know, when you talk about studying things, that's kind of a general statement, isn't it? When you talk about reading, it's kind of a general statement. In other words, if you were to tell most Christians they ought to be well-read on spiritual things, the question would be, what should I read? But see, it actually isn't a question. This is what you ought to read, the Word of God. And so you can boil it down. Anybody can read this book. Hey, any, anyone anywhere who wants to have a theological debate can try to uh, pull a trump card on you, if you will, by quoting some source you've never heard of. You know, some well-respected somebody in some generation, you've never heard of them, you never read them. Have you ever read what? You know, so-and-so said about whatever. And if you haven't read them, then you're not well-studied. Well, my friend, uh, let me just tell you something. From a Christian vantage point, it doesn't really matter what book you've read. If you haven't read this book, you don't know anything. And your response to that is, no, I haven't read that. I've read the Scripture, though. Let me show you what it says. See, most Christians, though, are more well-read on extra biblical sources than they are in the Word of God itself. Uh, you know more about how some preacher got up and gave an explanation that really made sense to you than you know about what's in the Bible. I'm going to tell you something. An illustration is just an illustration. It's not inspired. I've had people try to illustrate the Trinity before. I'm going to tell you something. You can illustrate the Trinity all you want to, but you don't know that the, that's a biblical doctrine unless you know it from the Scripture. You can illustrate God's ability all you want to, but you don't know about it. You don't understand it unless you know it from the Scripture. You understand, you understand what I'm saying tonight? In other words, an illustration, uh, I, and, I, and I don't have a contempt for all illustration, but I am contemptuous of individuals who had rather have an illustration than to have it just laid out in the Word of God. you know what I mean? I appreciate when somebody can take something and help you to understand it by illustrating it, but it is nothing to understand it if you don't know where it's said. You don't understand it if you just know an illustration. There are so many people that can explain anything with an illustration, but yet it wouldn't be true. I remember, uh, for instance, I remember talking to a guy about, uh, about the Holy Spirit of God and about the work of the Spirit of God, and we disagreed about what is appropriate and what is inappropriate, what would be blasphemy to, to attribute to the Holy Ghost, and he believed and, uh, you know, barking like dogs and laying on the ground and babbling and so forth and believed that that was the work of the Holy Spirit. And I was trying to show him the Scripture, but he said, hey, brother, now let's just, let's just talk about this from a logical standpoint. I think, okay, logical, let's go to the Word of God and let's look at it, let's parse it, let's look at the Scripture. He said, God is like an elephant. <laughs> right away I got to thinking, you know, I'm probably not going to agree with this. God is like an elephant. And we're like blind men thinking, I don't like what we're like, and I don't like what God's like. I don't want to worship an elephant, and I don't want to be a blind man if I don't have to. And he said, you know, well, it's like we're blind men all over the elephant. One guy's got a hold of the tuft on the tail. And another guy has a hold of the tusk, and another guy has a hold of the trunk, and another guy has a hold of the toe. And every one of us is experiencing the elephant. And one guy says it feels coarse and hairy, and another guy says it feels smooth and solid. Another guy says it feels flexible and strong. Another guy says, and you know, he's describing the different parts of the elephant, he said, and it's all an elephant. But we just get a different perspective based on our experience. And I looked at the poor fellow in the face and I just said to him, I said, it's a very unique illustration. I said, but the problem with it is that God is not an elephant. And you know, that is the problem with that illustration. It's a great illustration about how a person can experience different things. But the fact of the matter is that the Bible says God is a spirit and they worship Him, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And your experience does not make God what He is. God is what He is. And if it's really God, you'll experience it. But there are a lot of false spirits that can give you an impression 
that you think is God. It isn't God. You've got to find it in the Scripture. Get this? Understand this? Okay, so as we're looking at apologetics, and this is a good passage for it, understand and know that it isn't human logic, it isn't human reasoning that makes the Gospel indefensible or makes the Gospel powerful. It's the Holy Spirit of God, the power of God. And we're introduced to our text in verse 16 this evening, being told that as Paul is here in Athens waiting for Timothy and Silas to join him there, that he looks about him, and, and we're told in verse 17 that he was going to the market daily and, and uh, in the synagogue, and he met a lot of people, met a lot of Jews there. But in verse 16, we're told that he was dismayed or he was his stirrup was spirit, stirred in him. Did I say his stirrup was spirit in him? His spirit was stirred in him because the city, the Bible says, was, you don't see that next word there? Wholly or completely. In other words, this is an inclusive term on, on purpose. Uh, the Holy Spirit uses Luke, who's a very accurate writer, to say the, the spirit, the, that the city was completely given to idolatry. And then in passing, or not in passing, but in illustration of that, we're told that Paul was daily going to the synagogue and to the market. Now, whom do you think Paul was interacting with in the synagogue? With whom? Jews. What? Pharisees. Pharisees. Sadducees. Sadducees. Jews. Jews. And Jews who were in a city that was holy, what? Given to idolatry. What must have been the custom of those Jews in the synagogues that Paul was interacting with? What? They got together and debated. Yeah, they had to get together and debate. Yeah, they were Athenians. But according to verse 16, what might they have done? Oh, idolatry. They're idolaters! They're idolatrous, idolatrous Jews. I'm not, even, I'm not even sleepy tonight and having a hard time talking. Uh, anyway, these Jews are idolatrous. And in the marketplace, it would have been natural for Paul, because of who he was by his birth, and because of who he was affiliating with when he went to the synagogues during the day, would have been a, a natural for him to come into company with whom? What, what classification or uh, national group of people? Jews. Who? Jews. The Jews. So everywhere Paul went, he's running into Jews, and he was upset because the whole city, it seemed like everybody in Athens was worshiping idols. Now we know that Judaism is idolatry. Truth of the matter is the Judaism of Paul's day was idolatry. They were not worshiping God. They were not worshiping Jesus. The synagogue system of worship was far more respected than was the temple which was at Jerusalem. And Paul is absolutely positively grieved at the idolatry of the day. And so in verse 18, the Bible says that certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said... What will this babbler say? Others some. He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Oropagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Now, Oropagus is an outcropping, a rock outcropping, and Mars Hill is, is right there where Oropagus is. Matter of fact, it's, it's a landmark today, probably more famous because Paul was once there, then because of the fact that it was a place of, uh, it was a place of great philosophical interaction. It was a place of prominence in its day. Today, it's not prominent for those reasons. It's prominent because that's where Paul preached the gospel at. And so, I'm told by individuals that have been there that if you're going through Greece, you're going to go to Athens. One of the one of the places that the Athenians are going to take you is to Mars Hill, and you're going to stand on that marble there on Mars Hill, that smooth surface that's natural marble on a, on a hill, and you're going to look at the outcroppings of Oropagus and have a view of Athens from there, and they're going to tell you the story of the Apostle Paul. And I think that that is uh, not just classic, and not just ironic, but it's very fitting for the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that all the philosophers all the ways of life and all the debating about religion and about what life's about, that the lasting impression on Mars Hill is, is that Paul preached the gospel there. It's the greatest event that ever happened in that place as far as the world knows. And I, I think that's, that's ironic. 
But they wanted to know what he had to say. In verse 19, they said, May we know what this new doctrine where thou speakest is, for thou bringest strange things to our ears. We would know wherefore what those things, therefore what these things mean. Now you know what Epicureans and Stoics are, right? Epicureans would be individuals who operate from a philosophy of life that life is about pleasure and enjoyment. In other words, we know we're not going to live forever, so live it up while you can. Uh, we may not be able to live this way tomorrow, so live this way today. So enjoy the pleasures of life to its maximum. As far as we know, that's all there is to life is pleasure. Those are Epicureans. Stoics are individuals that say, you know, the pleasures of life are fleeting. And uh, any pleasure that you have is only for the moment, and then it will go away, and it will leave you feeling empty. And so you're better off than ever to experience it to begin with. You would be better off to control yourself and to live, uh, you know, a very, very uh, ascetic life or a very a life of self-denial. Uh, don't eat for the enjoyment of it. Eat for the survival of it. Uh, don't do something for fun. Do something for the utility of it and be as frugal with life as you can because that's all you can get out of life. Now, I don't know about you. Most of us would probably be uh, Epicureans uh, with a little bit of Stoicism, but there are some vegetarians around, and so I suppose that uh, you know there might be some Stoics among us as well. So, uh, in my mind, I, I think of Stoics as vegetarians. Hey, that looks terrible. Let's eat it. You know that sort of thing. Um, that looks good. Better not. You know uh, that sort of thing. That's the way I see it. Okay, I'm sorry if you're a health nut. I apologize for picking on you for just a moment here. But if you know a health nut, pass it on. Tell them that I said it, and you'll get away with it. All right, moving forward. In verse 21, the Bible says, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. <laughs> this is kind of funny. <laughs> Charlie... About what time, about what date would uh, this have occurred, this, uh, this dialogue here in Acts, do you think? Fifty-eight, fifty-nine, maybe sixty. Fifty-eight, fifty-nine, maybe sixty? Yeah. You realize that these are millennials. <laughs> I've been picking on millennials for a week. And so there's no point in stopping, right? <laughs> I've been laughing all week about reading scientific research on millennials. I'm sorry, millennials. Uh, you know, it's, it's what Generation Xers do. We think we're better than everybody else. And so it's, it's our task, it's our job, right, to put everyone else down, to criticize everyone else and think you're better. So I've been, the, the millennials, you know, have been fodder for the canon of, of picking on people. But uh, I'll be honest with you, as I read this and I read characteristics of millennials, these folks at Athens really are millennials. The Bible says that they spent all their time. They spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. As I was reading about millennials last week in a scientific survey, one of the things it said was that they're very, very good team players. And they're really great at expressing themselves and working uh, with teams. But we don't really know how they are in the workplace because they don't have jobs. But they're very educated. Most millennials are still being educated. They're just learning a new thing. You know, they go to school and then maybe, well, that maybe didn't interest me so much. So they go to, to they change their major and get another major and they just keep learning and they're the most educated people ever and they know more about anything than anybody else except that they have no practical knowledge because they've never done anything. And that is the Athenians. I mean, you have Athenians that'll tell you you need to be an Epicurean. You have Athenians that'll, that'll tell you the virtues of Stoicism. And I can imagine the Stoics, you know. They had to have had beards and man buns, you know, the, the Stoic guys. And uh, the Epicureans uh, certainly you know, they were probably from the 1960s, actually. They were probably more the flower children with, you know, I can imagine tie-dye and, you know, long hair and bandanas and uh, rose-colored or, 
blue sunglasses. You know, anyway, okay, so now do you all see the Stoics and the Epicureans from the picture that I freshly painted you? Yes. The men, Stoics, are, are uh, you know, they have man buns and beards, and the Epicureans have long flowing beards, long hair, and bandanas, and they're wearing tie-dye shirts. Okay, so those are your Stoics and your Epicureans. And uh, they brought Paul to these guys, and they said, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Where, uh, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, I want to stop here, and I want to get serious for just a minute. I've made jokes about millennials and Generation X and all those sort of things all week long. Friend, I want to just tell you something. God doesn't know people by their generation. God knows them because He created in them. Uh, he made them living creatures and made them living souls. And in every generation, there certainly would be characteristics that would speak of, of a generation where you could paint a broad brush, but it never represents individuals. But if there are characteristics of generations, and if we are to reach our generation, we ought to know those characteristics and how to reach the same, oughtn't we? And one of the things that I think is frustrating to me is how that we always talk about the evil or the bad about a people in a generation, but we really don't talk about how to reach them. In other words, our concern isn't how to reach them. I'm going to just tell you something. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've found to be very helpful about millennials is that they're just open-minded. They don't know what the gospel is, so they've never really rejected it. They haven't really rejected anything. They're open to anything. And the truth of the matter is, is that uh, they're a lot easier, in my opinion, to reach with the gospel uh, than past generations which are born what they are and not considering anything else. So listen, you, you may think it's so, but it's not a bad thing for someone to be open-minded, particularly not if you can hit them with the truth. And these individuals at Athens said, we just want to hear something new. Well, you know what's a lot better than, hear, than saying we don't want to hear anything new. And there's a lot more opportunity in it. And we as believers ought to be embracing. We ought to be not embracing the culture of our generations, but we ought to be embracing the opportunity that is presented by the culture. And we ought to be looking at individuals who don't know who they are and what they think and what they're going to do and be able to show them, hey, listen, here's truth. At least they're open to it and win them. And that's what Paul did here. And look at what he did. In verse... 22, Paul started off by saying, guys, you're wrong about some things. You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Paul said, you're a little extreme. He said, when I was passing by, as I passed by, I beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now I've had some people tell me that this was actually, you know, they actually had written this inscription to the actual God. No, this is just this is just the Athenians covering themselves to make sure that all bases are covered. In other words, we worship every idol. I mean, I've got every Pokemon collected. <laughs> <laughs> We worship every idol. We're for every single one. But in case there's one we don't know about, we worship Him too. Here's His inscription, to the unknown God. In other words, they're careful to be careless about God. Now, Paul is going to here help them understand something. Paul is going to say, he's going to use this as a, as a launching point, a springboard to say, whom ye ignorantly worship, Him I declare unto you. In other words, the God that you worship out of ignorance, I want to tell you about the God you don't know about. One of the best things sometimes people can know is that they don't know. You know, a mistake I believe in Christianity has been to try to relate a person's religion to who God actually is. And boy, that can be really confusing because religion always imitates God. It's always confusing when a person thinks they might believe the truth. Listen, one of the best things you can do is to separate yourself from something. Somebody says they're Catholic, say, we're not Catholic. We're nothing like the Catholics, and here's why. Somebody says, I'm Mormon. You say, we're nothing like the Mormons, and here's why. In other words, understand and know what error is, and separate yourself from it. 
And Paul is here in this statement when he says, Him whom you ignorantly worship, I declare unto you. He is here in a fell swoop condemning all of the false worship because he's about to show them what a real God is like. See, what Paul has observed in Athens is that the Athenians are very, very careful to worship idols, but the thing that vexes him about the idols is they're little things made with men's hands. And we're going to notice this statement made with hands or men's hands here in a moment. You know, one of the reasons I believe that motivates an individual to worship an idol is because not only are you dependent on the idol, but the idol is dependent on you. Most idols, if you read about gods, quote, small g, gods and idols, most of those gods represent certain supernatural powers or characteristics or abilities, but they also have limitations. Um, a god who is able to make it rain or make it storm, a god of, of uh, the storms, is a god whose wrath has to be appeased, right? He's an angry god. And so you're going to have to do things in order to appease His wrath. Maybe sacrifice your baby to Him. Maybe, uh, maybe, and I know that sounds, sounds awful, but that, the gods are very demanding. Uh, maybe you're going to have to give Him a payment or do something for Him. And the irony of it is that that God has to have something from you and you have to have something from Him. Maybe a god is attributed to blessing to giving something good. But in order for you to get something good, you've got to do something for Him. And all of these gods need the man that worships them as much as the man has to wor is obligated to worship them. You see this? In other words, I want to just tell you something, Christian. God in heaven doesn't need us in order to be God. He doesn't need us in order to exist. And there's a big difference that Paul's about to draw here. And this is going to be his major point. Let's read down. Paul said in verse 24, he said, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And here Paul is speaking of all kinds of alcoves and cubbies and little uh, temples and buildings that are houses for these fake gods. And he's pointing as he gestures from this high point on Mars Hill. And he says... God doesn't need this. He's not living in these little temples made notice with hands. Neither is worshipped with notice men's hands as though He needed anything, seeing He give it to all life and breath and all things. Oh, you know, God is the planet and the planet needs us to nurture it and love it and sustain us. No, my friend, God is God and He made the planet. And God doesn't need anything. There's a big difference. And Paul is being very, very terse, uh, albeit very polite, very, very direct and very terse in how that he uh, addresses these philosophers and Stoics who are willing to hear anything. Ah, well, you know, bring it to us. Sock it to me, man. I'd like to hear about it. If you don't agree with me, that's cool, man. You know, and so he goes on to say in verse... 25, neither is worship with men's hands, though he needed any, needeth anything, needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And Paul said the difference between your gods and God is that your gods need something and you need God. My friend, you and I, when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, have got to communicate that all men need God. See, the problem many times is people think they don't need nothing from nobody. But the problem with that thinking is that they do need God. See, many times they're relating to God as though He is an idol made with men's hands. As though He is something... You know, it's uh, always a temptation to me when I go into an Asian restaurant, you know, a Chinese restaurant or whatever, and they have a little God there and they've got food out to it. If it's fruit, it's usually pretty fresh looking. I'm always tempted to grab and eat it because my point is He's never going to eat it. You don't need it. You know, and so um, they they're trying to feed the idol, trying to give him something for an offering because he needs to eat. But God doesn't need that, my friend. And it's very different. The Bible says in verse 26, "Hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth." In Athens, this would give me a good point. They like this. <laughs> 
in Athens, they didn't really like, they were, a, they were a very multicultural city. And they were all trying to be Athenians, not Jews and Gentiles and uh, individuals from around the world. And Paul is pointing out God's the creator of all men and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their, inhabit, of their habitation. In other words, God determines how long you're going to live and how long you're going to breathe. And here's what the Bible says, God determined that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. Now let's stop here. You see, do you see Paul's movement directly from the, from the statement that God does not need men, men need God, to helping the people to understand that they should seek the Lord if they might feel after Him? The Bible says and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. Friend, God made you so that you could know Him. When's the last time you were sharing the Gospel with somebody and you told them that? God made you so that you could discover Him. Oh, it's a good thing that you're open-minded. One of the things I say when I witness to people a lot of times, if they show any inkling of interest or if they listen at all, one of the things I say is, you know, I can tell you're a seeker. I can tell you're looking. You're open-minded. And that's a positive thing. Most people are like, oh yeah, I'm open-minded, I'm a seeker. Most of them aren't as much of a seeker as you'd hope they would be. But if they're willing to listen and even argue with you or dialogue with you, they are. They're open-minded. They're seeking. And you know from what Paul said about God that God made men so that they could seek Him, so that they could know Him. One of the things I tell people is, hey, if you'll seek God, you'll know Him. You know, And I tell people, you're on a journey, aren't you? I, mean, I had... Almost nobody tell me that they're not on a journey. You're on a journey. When I pray for someone after I've talked to them, tried to share them the gospel, even if they haven't received it, I say, God, I pray for this person on their journey that they come to know you as you are, as you made them, so that they could know you the way that you made them to know you. And this is what the Scripture is teaching here. God made people to know Him. And this is what Paul is bringing. You see the segue here? You see the, the uh, literary device that he's using? He's moved them right from telling them that God is a creator of all gods, or I mean of all men, that He's different from every other God, and that He made them so they could know Him. And Paul has gotten very directly to an invitation. And so we'll see what that invitation is. In verse 28 he said, For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. And here he begins to quote some of their poets. I don't know whether Paul was, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, you need to be well-versed in the literary classics and so forth as Paul was. Well, Paul probably had had it up to here with the things that he read as he passed by the temples and read the inscriptions on when he discovered that the city of Athens was wholly given to idolatry. Now, I want us to think about that here just for a moment. Let's jump back a little bit. Paul noticed and was vexed. He was bothered by the fact that Athens was wholly given to idolatry. Had Paul never been somewhere where people were unbelievers? Was it just a surprise? I mean, did he slip out of the Bible Belt by accident? Is that what happened? No. But what Paul was vexed by was that people were working so hard to worship God without any truth involved with it. And they had their wise sayings and their clever inscriptions. And here he is reciting one of their poets to them whom they held in such high esteem and looked up to almost as though he were a god. And Paul said, we also are his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold. Notice he used that word Godhead. If you're ever talking to Jehovah's Witness, take him here and ask him what it means. Notice uh, the Bible says, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And here Paul just simply asks the question, where'd you come from? And they always tell you Kansas, you know, Arkansas, wherever they came from. No, I mean, where did you come from? From my mom. Where'd she come from? From her mom. Where did they come from? Well, ultimately, if you get right down to it, God made me. And if we're made by God, we're His offspring. If we're made by God to know Him, then it's rather silly to think that God is made by our hands, isn't it? 
If we're made by God, if we're His offspring, then God isn't made by us. And with one fell swoop, with one slash of, the, uh, of a, just a logical truth, Paul has dispelled, he has dispensed with any notion that any idol in Athens is legitimate because they're all made with hands. I dispense with that, Andrew. Are you still with us? We dispense with the notion that any idol in Athens is legitimate because they were made with man's hands. So I know you're waiting for me to dispense with something. We're, just, we're done. We've dispensed with it. And Paul has done that. He said, if we're made by God's hand, if we're made by God, then how could God be made by, our, by us? And for people that just loved a clever statement or a clever a saying or, uh, you know, a mnemonic device or... Uh, any kind of a, you know wise poetic saying, this just resonated by, to them. Paul said, your poets said, we're all God's children. Well, people like to say that, don't they? Oh, we're all God's offspring. Paul said, if we're all God's offspring, if that's true, then it must also be true that all the, the gods that your poets worship cannot be gods because if God made us, He cannot have been made by us. You get this? So no idol is legitimate because every idol is made with man's hands. The Bible says in verse 30, Paul said at the time, in the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And now he said, let's make a decision on it, guys. For people that are open to everything and willing to commit to nothing, Paul is saying, hey, it's, it's time for the invitation. It's time to commit. Here's why. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. That's Jesus. Where he hath given assurance unto all men and that he raised him from the dead. How do you know Jesus is God? Well, the resurrection, my friend. The resurrection is undeniable, indisputable evidence that Jesus is God. And do you know that Paul was in the century of eyewitnesses? He himself was an eyewitness of the resurrection. And that the things that he did with his hands were evidences that Jesus was God. And my friend, you know that today this book is every bit as much an evidence of the resurrection as an eyewitness account. You study 2 Peter chapter 1 sometime and look at what Paul says about the more sure word of the prophecy. In verse 32, the Bible says, When they had heard, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, We'll hear thee again of this matter. So here's what happened at the invitation when Paul said, repent, believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus because of the resurrection. They said, ha, 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 we don't believe in the resurrection. Other people said, well, you know, we're going to have to hear a little more about this. But then in verse 33, uh, the Bible says, so Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. Among whom, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. And so in that generation, in that location where individuals prided themselves so much on being open-minded and they didn't do anything more than sit around and hear a new thing or uh, listen to a new thing or consider something. They were so open-minded that they were probably not very practically of any good. We kind of make fun of that generation because they didn't produce much, did they? But I just want to tell you something. A generation of seekers is a generation that has a chance to find. Did you hear me tonight? A generation of seekers is a generation that has the opportunity to find truth. And Dionysius the Areopagite, do, do you catch this? Where was Paul taken? Areopagus. This is a person who is named after the location where Paul... You talk about a seriously entrenched citizen of the, of the area. And Damaris and other devout people followed Paul, clung to him, and believed in his Jesus. Friend, our message is not that the world is wrong. Our message is that Jesus is the answer. Our message isn't that generations are full of failures and that they're headed down the tubes and then this person isn't as good as this person or that uh, philosophy or way of thinking isn't as good as this one. Our message is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and that no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. And we ought to be glad for individuals that want to hear a new thing. Sometimes it can be frustrating. 
You know, sometimes as a pastor, it's frustrating how open-minded people are. They, you should be open-minded to the Scripture, but sometimes people get saved, and boy, I mean, they're just ready to believe anything that anybody teaches them. Pretty soon you watch them going off to this church and that church and learning this doctrine and that doctrine, and they're not biblically sound, and they don't have any way of having discernment because they're too open-minded. But friend, those same individuals can be seekers. And you know the way to win those individuals? Be teachers. Anyone who's a seeker can be taught truth. And that's exactly what Paul did. You think Paul was a little bit aggravated about Athens and about the fact that people would devote themselves so much to a fake God when there was a real God to be worshipped? How stupid is that? Make an idol with your hands and devote your life to worshipping. How dumb is that? Paul's response was not to say, hey, y'all are dumb. His response was to say, hey, listen, if you're made by God, then God isn't made by you. And if God isn't made by you, then you'd better consider Jesus who has risen from the dead. And if you consider Jesus who has risen from the dead, you can be saved and you won't have to face judgment because God is going to judge the world. And so he just preached the gospel. Sadly, if you read some apologetics books, you don't really get out of it that Paul preached the gospel. That's precisely what he did. He just took the place where they were at and he used it as an opportunity to go right into preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did not dilute the gospel. I've had people say, well, Paul, you know, Paul was lifting up the poets. No, he wasn't. He was saying if what the poet says is true about God, then what, you, what he believed about idols can't be true. In other words, if God made us, then the gods that the poet who said were all God's offspring, he can't be right about two things. He can't be right in worshiping idols and right in saying we're made by God. And so he just pointed out the inconsistency of this other generation and pointed out the truth of the resurrection. Is that how you share the gospel? Hey, Christian, you know, it's too bad when we think we share the gospel by, by reciting a line. Hello, I'm Ryan. I'm from Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, and I've just come by to ask you, if you were to die today, do you know for sure whether or not you'd go to heaven? I'm so tired of hearing that. Hey, how are you today? Figure out where somebody's coming from. Don't try to think you're smart enough to manipulate them into believing the gospel. But find a point. Find, find a connection, a place to go from. What do you believe about God? Listen to what they say about God and then take it to the Scripture. That's what Paul did. Hey, they believe God made all men, but they also believe that men made God. Can't both be true, can they? Now let's look at what God said. That was a good way to share the Gospel. It wasn't just logic and philosophy. It's not a philosophical passage where Paul is embracing and addressing the philosophies of the day. He's preaching the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And what motivated him to do it was that he saw idolatry and saw people in unbelief. Have you ever seen idolatry and people in unbelief? Is your response to preach the gospel? That's the example. Father, I pray that you would help us to embrace the scripture, to learn what's written. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to practice it and be effective at preaching it. As a result of what we learned tonight, in Jesus' name.